So there has been a slight uh, title change. It's Code Security Reinvented now. Um, so my name is uh, Xavier. I'm French, but I live in Palo Alto, California, with my wife, my three kids, my three cats, and my three koi fish. Um, and uh, I'm working at GitHub, GitHub, which is the AI-powered uh, developer platform where more than 100 million developers build, scale, and ship secure software. Um, so there is, of course, a commercial side to GitHub's mission. But you, I hope, all know that there are also sides of GitHub that are not commercial. For example, GitHub Education, where uh, we give resources to students and faculty to um, learn how to develop software. And of course, everything that we do for open source. And I am on, I am on this side, I am part of this side. Uh, I am leading the GitHub Security Lab. It's a team of hackers uh, who find and help fix security vulnerabilities in open source projects. Uh, so disclaimer, I'm not working for GitHub products, so I won't be able to answer all of your questions about GitHub products if you have them. Uh, but I will give you the perspective of a user of these products, uh, basically of an open source customer of these products. And so this talk is about the impact of AI on security, and I will illustrate that with what I see in uh, open source. So let's start with the state of open source security. Open source code is everywhere, right? Um, in all the software that is crucial for our lives, whether in transport, medical, defense, uh, finance, open source is everywhere, and we all depend on it. Uh, however, there is a lack of security expertise. Some studies say that there is only one security professional for 100 developers. Uh, and this is a number for global software, right? So you can imagine that it's even worse for open source where um, they have less resources. So this imbalance is much worse in open source. In addition to that, there is a disconnect between security and developers. Security experts think that developers don't care about security. And for developers, security is often the department of no. You know, the people who are blocking them, the people who are slowing them down, the people who are preventing them to ship features. Uh, this is similar, you know, to the disconnect that we had between dev and ops, you know, before the DevOps movement, right? Where dev and ops were working on competing objectives, innovation and stability. So now it's the same, you know, for security, we have competing objectives, innovation and security. And here again, the situation is worse in open source um, because these two communities are often not collaborating very smoothly, to say the least. So what we need to do, well, we need to shift left. We hear that a lot, right? But what I see a lot happening is um, people trying to run the traditional security tools and practices earlier in the development process. And that cannot work. These tools and practices are made for the security teams, not for the developers, right? And security teams will be able to understand and to act on the findings, but they are not designed for developers and they will generate even more frustration uh, and friction between the teams. The best example of that is uh, false positives. Developers hate false positives, right? And um, just moving these tools earlier in the development process will reinforce the disconnect. If these tools bring a lot, a deluge of false positives to developers, developers will have a confirmation that security is the department of no and they are blocking us for no reason. And you know what happens when um, you have an alarm that goes off frequently for no reason. Well, after a few false alarms, people tend to ignore it. So developers will, tend, will begin to ignore these alarms, you know, and security will have confirmation that they were right. Developers don't care. So you will have a reinforcement of these wrong assumptions on both sides. So what's the solution? Well, we need to empower developers. Right? We, just, we cannot just 
shift left by just uh, moving left the, these, these, these tools and these practices, we really need to give developers autonomy and expertise, right? And that includes, you know, designing the tools for them, for their use cases. But we really need to shift left a culture of security. So this is the agenda for the, the rest of this presentation. So we, we show the state of open source security. Next, I will show you what it takes to effectively shift left a security culture, right? What we are doing um, right now as humans. And then we will see how AI accelerates, augments, and reinvents this. And finally, we will finish with uh, some perspectives. So we will start with talking about what we are doing as humans. It will be a bit boring, and then the robots will come in. So bear with me. Um, so yeah, shifting left the security culture, this is not easy. Uh, encouraging developers to adopt security practices is a bit like encouraging my kids to eat vegetables. Developers prefer to ship features, and they leave the security, you know, to the side of the plate. Well, despite the provocative analogy, I don't believe that developers are childish, and I don't believe that developers don't care, right? I believe that they need to be empowered. So this is a cake that my wife baked for my son's birthday a few years ago. Um, who can take a guess what's in this cake? No one? Well, chocolate? No, there is a question mark here. So it's not chocolate. It's anything but chocolate. We're looking for a vegetable. No. No. Huh? No. 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 It's worse than that. No. Sorry? It was, it was for nine years old. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, beets, red beets. And the kids loved it. And imagine, nine years old kids, right? Pretty difficult judges when it comes to uh, food. And they loved it. And my wife was doing this all the time. She was integrating the vegetables into a meal that the kids love. And what does it mean for security and developers? Well, we should try to integrate security practices into what developers love. And what do developers love? Coding. So my solution to really shift left effectively is to integrate security into the existing practices, into the existing developers too into their existing flow, not in another tool. I want to integrate that into the developer's IDE, into the developer's browser, not into another process. I want to integrate security into the current development process, whatever it is for your organization. And so we talked about vegetables, but this is what worked with DevOps, right? Developers started testing when they could code their test you know, with XUnit and Fitness and Selenium, et cetera. Developers started coding deployments with infrastructure as code. So I think this is really the solution for security. Bring the community's expertise into the developer's flow. So now let me show you a few examples of how we are doing that uh, at GitHub and in my team. The first example is how developers can secure their dependencies. So my team maintains the GitHub advisory database. This is an open source uh, information about security vulnerabilities disclosed in open source projects. It's free, it's open source, because we think that vulnerability information in open source is a common good. And because it's open source, we receive more than 1,000 community contributions per year. So this database, we Originally, we take data coming from the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, from some uh, other sources like uh, RustSec, like uh, PyPy, et cetera. But we also get um, community contributions from anyone who has the information and the knowledge and the expertise. 
we review it in my team, we create it, and we make it available for everyone. For example, as soon as this uh, denial of service vulnerability is disclosed, it gets reviewed in our advisory database with important information such as the CWE, the CVSS score, and very important, the affected versions and the patched versions. And with that, this information will flow directly to Dependabot. Dependabot is the SCA tool uh, by GitHub, which is free for everyone. And if you're on GitHub, Dependabot will create automatically a pull request in all the projects that depend on WorldWrap if they use one of the affected versions. And so as a developer, you know, I just have to review the pull request and merge it if I'm happy with it. So I have really here knowledge coming from the community and ending up into my developer flow. This is exactly what I would do if I get a suggestion in a fixed suggestion in any pull request. Um, you will note that there is a box, a yellow box here, with a nice message from Dependabot. Well, it's not nice, it's a bit passive aggressive, you know. Oh, you're a bad maintainer, you don't care about me, so I will pose my interactions with you. Um, well, <laughs> indeed, it, it's because I kept this uh, alert intact so that I could take the screenshot for this presentation. But more seriously, this feature is another example of how a security tool can try to be less disruptive for the developer's flow, right? Oh, I detect that you seem that, it seems that you don't care for any reason, I will pause and I will not bury you uh, under a, lo a lot of useless reminders. My second example is how you can secure your code. So at GitHub, we have a static analysis engine called CodeQL that finds security vulnerabilities in your code. It's also free for open source. It takes one click uh, to enable. And unlike the, well, the difference with the other static analysis uh, engines is that CanQL has a very powerful time tracking uh, to track malicious data through your code. It does it across different functions, across different files, across different libraries, and even through libraries uh, external to your code. For example, CodeQL can detect Log4Shell, the 2021 JNDI injection in Log4J, because it can track the untrusted data from the call to the logger down to the uh, JNDI call. And this data, it flows through more than 150 steps in the code, in more than 10 different files, right? And CodeQL is able to detect it. All of this, again, is free for open source. Yes, question. Yeah, so, so CodeQL uh, is uh, available for, you can visit CodeQL.com. You have uh, Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, C, C Sharp, C++, Python, Ruby. Uh, I think that's it, and yeah, the, that's the languages. Yeah, I might have forgotten one or two, but yeah. Um, yes, wait, wait. And yes, of course, we, we are trying to uh, implement other languages. It's, it's, it has to be done language per language because how it works is that we, to be able to do this powerful time tracking, we really need to adapt each of, the, of, of our data model and our control flow to each language to have something very precise without the false positives that we, we all hate. Um, yeah, and this is, CodeQL is what my team uses, for example, for finding vulnerabilities in open source, and you can check our CodeQL wall of fame. We find more than 100 vulnerabilities, 100 CVs with CodeQL on open source projects every year. And this is used also by, um, by the community. The second line here, it, they are not in my team. Jordi and Alexandra, we are working at uh, Google Security but they're using it and then they can say, hey, we find the CV with CodeQL. Um, so yeah, so once enabled, you will benefit from hundreds of security checks designed by the GitHub security experts, but also by security experts from the community because the queries are open source, the code queries are open source. So by just enabling the scanner, you will benefit from this ever-growing expertise automatically without doing anything. 
and you will basically sit on the shoulders of giants because our uh, security teams at customers who are using CodeQL and writing, improving these queries, you will benefit from that automatically when they reach uh, the, um, the open source repo. Uh, and of course, the GitHub team curates these queries so that they have a very, very low false positive rates because again, we don't want to interrupt developers in their flow. Right, so basically you have two kind of queries, queries that are designed for developers with very low false positive rates, and you have queries designed for security teams, the ones that my team uses, for example, with, uh, we care more about false negatives uh, ourselves, so we will have a lot of false positives, but we triage them. So by default, you have the standard queries for developers. Just by adding one line into your configuration, you can also benefit from the security queries sourced from the community. And for my purpose here of uh, enabling empowering developers, these alerts are displayed in the developer's flow, in their pull request, next to, your, next to the code, next to the very line of code, right? So I remember this um, friend who was engineering manager, it was five years ago, and he was very happy because his uh, SAS tool was upgrading, and he tells me, hey, you know, the previous version was generating the security alerts in a big PDF, and now it will generate Jira issues, and developers will love it. Well, they did not love it, right? Because, yes, we can all agree that Jira issues, it's much better than a big PDF, but it was not in their flow, right? So instead, here you have the community expertise flowing directly to the developer's flow in their code, in their pull request. You notice also here the link show more details that will just open you know, uh, more information about the vulnerability, how to fix it, uh, because again, we are speaking also here about shifting left expertise and not only just the security file. And it works. By bringing these alerts into the developer's flow, by eliminating false positives, we obtain an impressive fix rate. Half of these alerts are fixed immediately when and where they are raised, which is really a testament to the effectiveness of, yeah, shifting left really and empowering developers. My last example is this training that my team uh, developed. It's uh, a game. It's a uh, a set of challenges uh, to train your developers on secure code. And it's an in-repo game, so developers just have to clone, read code, run tests, fix the code, rerun the tests. And it's open source, so we have contributions from the community who are adding more challenges as we go. So here again, same principle community-powered, because it's open source, and directly usable by developers. It's in their IDE or in their browser, and they are just doing what they usually do as developers. They read code, they code, they test, they fix. So again, an example of community security knowledge flowing at the fingertips of your developers. And when you think about it, this is a perfect use case for AI getting the community's knowledge and bringing it to the fingertips of your developers. So now, let's explore how AI can accelerate, can augment this solution, and yes, how it reinvents, really, the way we are thinking about shifting security left. So I will illustrate this exploration with uh, GitHub's pair programmer, GitHub Copilot. I'm pretty sure that some of you forgot, but GitHub Copilot has been around for quite some time now. We announced it in June 2021, and so it was really the first production-ready AI pair programmer. And I want to, uh, to say loud that it's not here to replace developers, right? It's here to help them be more productive by eliminating low-value tasks, such as writing regex, right, so that they can focus on higher value tasks, right? This is the goal of GitHub Copilot. And last year, we surveyed uh, 500 developers 
from uh, Fortune 100 companies about their use of GitHub Copilot. And nearly 90% reported that they were completing ta tasks faster. But what I find even more important is that 88% say that it helps them stay in the flow. And it helps them focusing on more satisfying work. And this is exactly what we want to do. So, well, I will repeat that throughout the presentation. AI is not here to replace developers, just to make them more productive by accelerating the low value added tasks. So now we are going to explore several ways developers can use AI to leverage the world's security knowledge. And remember, with the same exigence that we stated earlier, we want this knowledge in our flow. We want this knowledge to accelerate what we do and not to slow us down. And uh, yes, a small disclaimer, what I will show now. So what I showed you, the whole GitHub security suite is free for open source, right? But Copilot is not, and therefore the AI features that I will show you are not, right? Uh, but again, I'm not in the product team, so I cannot tell you if that will be in the future. So let's get started with writing safer code. Can someone in the audience spot the bug here? It's a SQL injection. Indeed, the uh, user is concatenated directly into the SQL query. So uh, what can happen? Well, the uh, attacker, do, does it play? Yes, the attacker can uh, put another SQL query in that query and drop users, for example. So drop your table. Uh, it can, he can, they can create um, an admin user with elevated privileges. They can um, enumerate all users of the table, which can leak private information. Well, so that's a SQL injection that's bad. But if I delete the code that I've written and I leave it to GitHub Copilot to propose something, the suggestion is safe from this SQL injection. It uses uh, parameterized queries, right? And so the um, the, the user control value uh, is not passed anymore into this query. Yes. Sorry? Are you running a form of security scanning for each suggestion from the copilot? No. Let me, let, me, let me tell you how it works. So how does it work? It's because we added a, vulnerab a vulnerability filter on top, of, uh, on, on top of copilot, right? So originally, codex, the LLM developed by OpenAI that powers uh, Copilot, it's trained on all public open source code available on GitHub. So the suggestions are by default as secure or as insecure as this public code. Um, but we added this filter. This filter is another LLM that is trained on CodeQL, right? And so this LLM is able just to identify the most common vulnerabilities like path injections, sequence injections. And then identifying these most common vulnerabilities, this LLM is able to remove them from Copilot's suggestions. And so at the end, the suggested code will be safer than the original code that Codex was trained on. Does that answer the question? Okay. But, I will repeat this again. Copilot is not here to replace developers and Copilot is not here to replace DevOps practices, right? Uh, it's even the opposite. I'm saying that GitHub Copilot makes you um, gain some time writing code. You should do more of DevOps practices. It's an opportunity to do more <laughs> DevOps practices. Um, now let's move on to examples of where AI can help us find security issues. So we will see several examples of that. One, finding uh, leaked credentials. Two, finding security vulnerabilities in your code. And three, doing a code review. So in GitHub Advanced Security, the GitHub's uh, security product suite, uh, you have a feature called secret scanning to detect secrets like keys, tokens in your code. 
that you, you have checked you know, into your repositories. Again, free for uh, public repositories. And this is important because, you know, according to um, Verizon's uh, data breach report in 2023, use of stolen credentials was by far the preferred way for attackers to breach into an organization. So preventing, preventing secrets to leak into public code is going a long way to protect our organizations. One million secrets in public code was detected by GitHub's secret scanning only during the first eight weeks of this year. That's more than 10 secrets per minute. You know, I, I thought that it would not, that it doesn't happen frequently yeah, to push secrets in code. Well, I was wrong. It happens all the time. So in addition to detecting secrets when they are already in repositories, we added a feature called push protection, which is a proactive uh, detection of secrets leaked locally. And then when you try to commit to, sorry, to push this commit to a shared branch, then push protection would kick in and would block you and would tell you, hey, no, you are trying to push a secret to this branch. So it will tell you how to, how to remediate that. And so the secret will, will never reach a public branch uh, in the first place. And this feature was opt-in until now, right? And last year, we, this feature prevented more than 30,000 secrets to reach uh, public repositories just last year alone. And so it was opt-in, but uh, given the, the, the scope uh, of the problem, we decided to enable it by default. So now it's enabled by default. It's been two weeks now. And so you will have to opt out. But by default, we will prevent you to push a secret into a public repository. And back to our topic, how can AI help us here? So all these secrets that we detect in code uh, is because we are partnering with different providers like AWS, for example, AWS, Apple, etc. And we have 180 partners and more than 220 uh, patterns, so regular expressions, provided by these uh, companies that we can detect. But you might still have some uh, custom patterns that you want to detect that are very specific to your organization. And f these patterns, you will have to write them with uh, regular expression, right? And well, we saw in the earlier example that writing regular expressions is not uh, uh, always, always easy. Uh, a colleague of mine was saying that the plural of rejects is regrets. And so to make it easier and faster for you, now we include this uh, form, you know, where you have an AI-powered experience that guides you through creating those uh, custom patterns. And so this feature, well, it's not only an incredible time saver, right? But it helps you get the good coverage that you need to make sure that your secrets are secure. Uh, we are shipping another AI-powered feature. It's now in uh, public beta, um, but it's uh, AI-powered detections of passwords. So if you try to use the traditional scanning methods with regex matching, you will have a high false positive rate to detect passwords because they, they don't have a structure, you know? So, so uh, we are... Um, shipping this new feature where we are asking AI to detect whether passwords are leaked in code. And so far, the results are pretty promising. Uh, we have a very low false positive rate. Um, even with that low false positive rate, what we will do is that we will um, display these, uh, these results in a separate section uh, with other low confidence patterns because the rationale here is that, again, we don't want to block developers in their flow, so we are displaying separately the detections that are high, high confidence, low false positives, and uh, uh, the, the findings that are uh, low confidence and potentially high false positives. Again, we don't want to interrupt developers for nothing. Same principle. So that was for secret scanning. Now let's look at um, 
finding security bugs in your code. So we talked earlier about uh, scanning your code with uh, CodeQL, our static analysis engine. Um, and now we are shipping a feature called code scanning autofix. So code scanning will now propose AI generated fixes right in the pull request. It will enable your developers to instantly fix vulnerabilities while they code, right? And we think that it will give another, an, an, uh, an even better remediation time. If you remember, we had a 50% fix rate when the alert was read in, in, in the pull request. We hope that by providing a suggested fix in addition to the alert, will make it even easier for developers to act on these alerts. And you know, these suggestions will also help developers to quickly understand the vulnerability and how to remediate it. Because they will basically have a concrete example of an insecure pattern, their code, and of a secure pattern with the fix. And so it's, it's also you know, contributing to shift left expertise at the same time. So this is at the moment uh, for JavaScript and TypeScript, but more languages are coming up. So let's see uh, that in action. So here I'm writing a very simple code. I'm personalizing uh, Hello World by adding a name. Uh, I see that there is a, a reflected subscript thing here, a reflected XSS in the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the alert in my pull request. And then, so of course here, you can see where the data flows. So again, there are only two steps here, but remember for, for log 4 shell for example, it's 150 steps that you could see in there. <coughs> um, okay, and then on this alert, you see that, well, you can dismiss it if you deem that it's a false positive. But now this is the autofix. Autofix will generate, will generate a fix for you. The fix consists in uh, sanitizing uh, the, the, the user control parameter with this call to escape. And this fix, well, you can edit it, you can dismiss it, or you can commit it directly. Uh, you can see that this fix spans across different files, not only your original file, right? It's a, it's a proper fix LLM generated to uh, uh, help you uh, remediate this vulnerability. Again, it's right into your pull request, right into your flow, not anywhere else. And it's again an example of securities community knowledge flowing into uh, your, your flow. Now let's look at my third and last example for finding security issues, code review. So in my team, so I reg regularly ask my hackers to find, uh, well, to audit some open source code that they are not familiar with. Right, and so I guess it's also the case in organization when they ask security teams to audit some uh, code that they don't know about. So I can use uh, GitHub Copilot chat, which is available through GitHub Copilot Enterprise, to describe the attack surface of a project. Right? So the attack surface is the number of possible attacker, attacker, attack vectors. Um, where an attacker can access and abuse the system, right? So entry points to the system, um, locations where there are uh, accesses to, um, uh, to assets of the system, right? So here I'm asking the attack surface and I get an answer from Copilot chat telling me the different entry points, the different points in the, in the code that I should look at. You can see, you can know that it first starts telling me, hey, uh, I won't perform the audit for you. Yes, of course. Once again, it doesn't replace you. It just accelerates the process. You know, it kind of quick starts the process. So now my hackers, for example, what they were doing before, they were looking at the documentation, you know, and then trying to find their way, uh, okay, what would be interesting? Oh, there's a database, okay, uh, so I will look at that. Now here, it just accelerates this process. This is another example of the same thing. Uh, and I use for that our secure code game repo, which is an intentionally vulnerable. And yeah, I was happy here that Copilot was able to tell me, oh, you know, you're using a database, so you should uh, pay attention uh, to SQL injection, you should pay attention to untrusted inputs, you should pay attention to um, managing um, elevated privileges. Um, and now my last 
example is for developer learning. As we said, uh, shifting left is also um, giving autonomy and expertise to the developers, not only the tooling. So let's see this example. I wrote some code, and again, you can see that there is a SQL injection in that code because stock symbol is controlled by um, an external user and is concatenated directly into the SQL query. So I'm a developer, let's say I'm a junior developer, and what do I do after writing the code? Well, I'm asking for a code review. So let's ask GitHub Copilot for a code review. And immediately, GitHub Copilot tells me that there is a SQL injection in my code. Okay, but um, what is a SQL injection? I don't really know, you know, I'm a, I'm a junior developer. Um, what is a SQL injection? So I'm asking, and I will get an answer immediately. That is not super helpful. I mean, I could, uh, I could get that from Wikipedia, right? But it's not helping. What I need is really to understand the consequences of the SQL injection. And I need to have that knowledge tailored on my code, right? This is how I will be really able to, to, to grasp completely what this SQL injection is about. And so I will get a clear answer here telling me, okay, yes, stock symbol is user controllable. You can add, uh, you know, all one equals one to that and it will enumerate all of your database. I can ask other, um, but again, this is really tailored to my example, to my code. So I can kind of test it and see it, right? I can ask clarifying questions. So here, what am I asking? Uh, yeah, can this attack uh, be used to damage my database? Okay, and yes, of course, if uh, the user adds drop users, to drop table to, to, uh, to the, to the uh, external symbol. So this is a way where, and, and only then, you know, only after that, when I understand, I can ask for a fix, right? But I just don't, you know, get a fix and apply the fix, I get expertise in addition. And this expertise is really useful and concrete because it's tailored to the context, to my context, to my code. Okay, so, so what did we see here? We saw how developers can use AI to leverage the world's security knowledge through several examples, but what I want to, uh, to point out to point out is that we saw examples spanning through the entire development process, right? We saw examples with coding, with code review, with test, and even with learning. Now I'd like to uh, conclude and give also some other perspectives. Um, so yeah, I think that it's, for me, it's pretty um, obvious that AI is reinventing developers day to day including uh, secure coding. And yeah, from the survey that we, that we had last year, uh, yeah, 92% of uh, developers surveyed are already using AI tools at work or for their personal projects. So it's there, right? And I want to repeat again that AI is an accelerator. It will not replace you, it's an accelerator, you know? And you will spend less time typing, you will spend less time searching the internet, and it's an opportunity for you to have more time for security, quality, design, learning. You know. And the good news is that from the same survey, this is exactly what developers want. They say that if they had uh, used if they were using AI coding tools to gain time, then they would like to use this time to focus more on code reviews and security reviews. Well, that's good. Now, um, every new technology breakthrough comes with positive and negative consequences, right? So this talk would not be complete without exploring the dark side, right? So, so I would just uh, tell you the two questions that people ask me uh, the most. The first one is, can Copilot reinforce insecure coding practices? And the second one is, can Copilot leak my private code to the public? 
there are others. I, I, I trust you to ask them after the talk, but uh, these two are, the, are the really the ones that are the most asked. So uh, it's a very legitimate question, right? Copilot is trained on public open source code. This open source code can be insecure. And a Copilot relies also heavily uh, on your surrounding context um, to tailor its suggestions. Therefore, you know, if you have a lot of insecure code in your team or in your project, then it's, yeah, it's natural that Copilot suggestions will, uh, will, will be, uh, uh, um, um, how can I say, um, tailored to that and will give you insecure suggestions. But, well, this is not new, right? This is already happening before Copilot. A junior developer getting into a team or on a project, the junior developer would be also uh, heavily influenced by the surrounding code. They will learn from the surrounding code. They will copy paste from the surrounding code. So that, that was already existing before Copilot. So three considerations for you is that, first of all, it was existing behavior before Copilot, but now Copilot will do it faster. <laughs> That's half a joke because uh, we will see later that it's, it's, it does that for secure code, for insecure code, but faster. The second thing is that, well, actually it's not true. It's a lie because we have this vulnerability filter that we apply on top of the suggestions. So this vulnerability, this vulnerability filter removes the most common security vulnerabilities. So at the end, the code generated by Copilot will be safer than your original context. And Finally, why the first point was half a joke? Because if you're going faster, use this time to do more DevSecOps. Use this time to do more design, more learning, more testing. You must not use Copilot without DevSecOps practices. Imagine the following scenario. Uh, you're a junior developer coming into a team, and in this team, there is a a piece of code you're working on where there are a lot of insecure patterns. You're using Copilot, and thanks to the vulnerability filter, the code suggested by Copilot is secure. The code that you're writing with Copilot is secure. Okay, but then during the code review phase, you have a colleague who tells you, hey, don't wave on the wheel. I've already uh, coded something that does exactly that, so reuse it instead of reinventing the wheel which makes sense. But then at the end, by doing that, you will become insecure. You will use this insecure code, right? So again, if you are using the gain time to do more DevSecOps, to do more learning, then you will hopefully prevent this uh, scenario to happen. So the second question that I get asked is whether Copilot can leak your private code and make it public. Because if you use my private code as, as training data, eventually suggestions to external users can end up in a public code. So GitHub Copilot for Business does not retain any prompt. So you know, in the, in the prompt, there will be your prompt. There will be also the surrounding code. And this, all of this prompt will be sent to the model. You will get back the suggestion. The prompt is not retained. It is discarded automatically just after a suggestion is returned. So no, your private code cannot leak to a public code. But there are more questions, of course. Again, I, I repeat that it's a new technology breakthrough. People have a lot of questions, and they are legitimate. So we created uh, uh, the Trust Center, the GitHub Copilot Trust Center with dozens of frequently asked questions related to security, privacy, transparency, just such as the one that I just answered. And again, these questions, they are legitimate. A lot of people are asking them, so you can go to this page. This is a great resource to understand what is happening uh, with your data when you use GitHub Copilot. Finally, uh, so this talk was focused on how AI can reinvent code security, but it's only you know, a small portion of what AI can help with when it comes to security. 
you know, sec software security is much broader, and we can anticipate a lot more applications of AI for software security, right? For threat intelligence, penetration testing, uh, malware analysis, security operations, incident response. My team is also using it for code security to um, to, to improve uh, fuzzing. For example, they are using coverage data, identifying um, gaps in the in the in the coverage, generating new fuzzing harnesses and then closing the loop with that. So yeah, certainly a lot more to come when it comes to how AI can uh, help security. So that's the end of this presentation. So you can follow us on uh, X with the GitHub, the GitHub Security Lab account to get more information about what we are doing for open source security. And uh, you can also follow me. Uh, thank you for uh, staying for this last slot of the of the of the conference. Uh, I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, if you have questions, I'm uh, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a couple questions. First of all, is the developer learning? It's part of the code. It, it has to be in the GitHub ecosystem. This is built in in the that ecosystem, right? Your co-pilot thing, right? You can't, we can't access, like for example, if I don't want to use GitHub, I just want to use the developer training, learning, I can't, right? You have to use GitHub in the background, right? So what I showed was with GitHub Copilot, but co uh, well, I know there are competitors out there uh, <laughs> for uh, who are al also uh, doing um, well, I know they are at least doing code completion. I'm not sure if there are. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you, you're not bound to, 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 to that. I showed example with the GitHub platform, but I'm pretty sure that in principle, uh -huh. having this kind of uh, developer helps where you can chat with a bot to get community expertise right in Oflo. I think yeah, that's, I that's a principle that I want to push, but right. I, I, I'm not aware of, uh, of, of other solutions. Okay, and one more question is, the code QL, you said it's open source, right? The queries are open source. So code QL, you have the engine that yeah. runs the queries on your code, yeah. and you have the queries, and in the, the, the knowledge, if you want, resides into the queries, because this is where a security researcher will say, oh, this pattern is insecure, let me, let me code it. So all these queries uh -huh. are open source. Okay, so I still need to go, like I can't, I still need to use GitHub, right, for this. So or do you have I a, I mean it's a, do it's you have a public source. repository? Huh? Is it a public repository that, that you have? Okay. Public open source? Um, I'm so, for example, if I use Bitbucket, which is Git on the back end, yeah. would it, I wouldn't be able to use the code, Q, code QL, right? Is your project open source and public? No, it's not. It's, a, it's, it's private, a, so it's no. Okay, so if, my, if I use Bitbucket, in the, it's, it's a public, I would be able to use yes. code QL. Okay. Yes, code QL right. is free for all public repositories, even if it's not uh, on GitHub. But if you're on GitHub, you will benefit from the integration, you know, and the alert in the pull request, etc. Yeah. But if you're not on GitHub, you can, and you have a public repository, you can still use code okay. QL right. on your code. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, I. So for for code QL, you have a nice feedback cycle, in my opinion. For example, if you are a security engineer, you can publish the queries via GitHub and you can maybe get a bounty for that query that you can get. And basically the entire open source ecosystem is improved. Do you also plan for something like this for the AI-based patches or the AI-based vulnerability detection? For example, myself as, as a security engineer to publish some patches which are uh, correct or to publish some vulnerability detection patterns? Uh, no, no, we don't. It's a... Uh yeah, it would be a nice, uh, a nice addition. Yeah. Um, I guess I have two questions. I have two questions. The first is, what is your stance on people hard coding test tokens or other 
sort of invalid tokens. Um, and from like a machine learning model perspective, I find ah, those are hard. Sorry, to I don't I don't hear uh, very well. But no, no, I think it's because of the noise. Uh, about, but. Uh, So my first question is, what is your stance on hard coding test tokens um, or secrets? And from from like, are, are those considered false positives? And um, because for ML models, I feel like they're very hard to distinguish those types of tokens that are structurally the same as a real token, but sort of the, the context in which they're used, um, sometimes people want to hard code those for uh, particular test reasons. And then the second question is, um, is there any application of using ML models to detect general sensitive data, um, like personal user information or other things um, beyond just secrets? Oh, okay, so the first question was about how, well, my stance on uh, these detections that are uh, detecting a lot of false positives. Uh, or just right like, are, are test tokens or test secrets considered um, false positives or are they like considered real detections? Like, what's your stance on whether people should be adding these to repositories or not? Hmm. Um, it depends, it depends. I, I, mean, I know that we have some some uh, secrets that are um, um, that are only for tests and that are not doing anything, and we can add them. But <laughs> it will be detected by the secret scanning, and then the developer will be able, you know, to say, "No, I dismiss. It's a false positive because blah blah blah." And 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 you you have the possibility to do that, right? Um, it's it's um. Hmm. My personal stance is that you know. This secret, if you have another way to <laughs> to 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 uh, to do that, it's it's better not to uh, to to add it in there, right? Um, because it's it's also kind of a, a habit, you know. Yeah, no, don't put secrets in there. Find another solution, right? Oh, it's only for tests. Oh, it's only a very limited secret to that. Mm. Perhaps yes, but I mean, if you can find a way to do it uh, in another way, please no, do it in another way. That's my stance, but. The product give the possibility to to have this this case managed. You can say no, it's a false positive detection. Uh, and then the second question was <laughs> um, just about using AI or machine learning models to detect general sensitive data like UII or personal identifying or information um, beyond just secrets. Oh yes, uh, th yeah, that's interesting. So this is something that uh, I. So again, I'm not in product, so I don't. I cannot tell you if we are looking at that too. But I know that it it was flowing like okay, a secret. What is a secret, right? Um, so I I don't know, but I know that it was uh, floating into discussion in in discussions. So is is this integrated tight tightly into GitHub? So if I was using a Git repository internally, is there a way for me to use the AI? So the AI, no. Um, secret scanning, no. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> but but CodeQL, for example, you can use it for any uh, public. So uh, advisory database, it's it's open source. You have an API. Yeah, you can use it for everything. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it depends. But the AI, no. Your question was specifically for the AI part, yeah. No, CodeQL, you can. CodeQL for it's free for public repositories. So, uh, and you can also uh, buy it for private repositories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know I have a lot of questions, but it's okay. maybe other people. I I did not understand. Why you said Copilot is reinforcing the insecure code? Now, were yeah. you saying that people were thinking now I don't have to write learn how to write secure code? Is that why it's or is it something else? Why is it re? Why are people saying it's reinforcing yeah. insecure code if it provides yeah. really good? So well, it's mm. so I don't know why they are asking that, but it's a question that I get asked a lot. I uh, I think that they might have read. Uh, that somewhere, but but when you think about it, it's 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 normal, right? Because uh, it's it's in, uh, influenced by your surrounding code. If you have a if you are on a project in a team, if you have uh, code that you already wrote that wasn't secure, 
it will automatically say, oh, I will try to adapt my suggestions, to prioritize my suggestion to match this style, for example. You, you, you know? And doing this, if you have wrote a, a lot of insecure code, then it will give you insecure code. You know, that's insecure in, insecure out, right? So that would be by default, but fortunately we have added this vulnerability filter on top that removes the insecure suggestion and hopefully, you know, breaks the visual circle and improves. Thanks, I also like your last bullet saying about the privacy, because you know, as security engineer, we're always concerned about, yes. I don't want to let people know <laughs> what, yes. you know, the stuff I have. So um, that was good. Any Yes, okay. yeah. And that, that's important for us. It is and important. One more thing I want to add. I like how you repeatedly said AI is not going to replace developers or AI did is not going to replace Did I repeat it enough? Or <laughs> I like how you said it repeatedly. Hopefully that's true. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it a pause for our Thank presenter. You. Thank you all.